Hello, everyone, and welcome to ACP's live remote non-CE offering. I'm Kelly Contreras, and I'll be the moderator for today's non-CE course. Today's non-CE topic is nursing overview, pain management, which will last approximately 60 minutes. It's my pleasure now to introduce my friends and colleagues um, who will be presenting today, Seema Gurnarni, Doctor of Physical Therapy and Board Certified Geriatric Clinical Specialist, Manager of Clinical Operations for ACP, and Dr. Kathy Woolman, Doctor of Nursing Practice and Gerontologic Nurse Practitioner, who's the Nursing Consult for ACP. Thank you so much, ladies, for preparing this presentation. I'm going to now turn it over to you. Hi, everyone. We appreciate you taking the time to join, join us today. Dr. Woolman and I will be reviewing the pain management reference guide, which was developed to support clinical programming at your facilities. We do also have more detailed courses available for nursing CEs on our online university, including a couple that correspond to today's guide on pain management. You can use the information from the courses and from the reference guides for facility-wide quality assurance or performance improvement plans, annual compliance training. You can keep the guides at the facility in a binder maybe for your new, your new employees, or you can use them to support better alignment between departments. Using this paid management guide today, we're going to orient you to the document first and show you how the general framework is for all of these guides, how they all, uh, the template that they all follow, regardless of the program topic. You'll see different, you know, how the different sections are clearly delineated and allow you to focus on specific areas based on your facility's needs, like a pathophysiology section nursing considerations, therapy considerations, and even an interdisciplinary collaboration section. They are designed so that you can break up the information and go through specific sections if you need to, you know, um, if you need to review, you know, specific sections at a time where you can go through the whole entire document, really just based on your education needs or time allotment. Once you're familiar with this basic structure, you should be able to easily navigate any of our guides. The templates all start off the same. So if we look at our screen, you know, with the first page or two covering prevalence of the problem and impact to the resident or facility, we get into person-centered care as well as ideas for resident identification for the program. In this particular guide on the second page, we cover the challenges to treating chronic pain in the older adult, as well as some points on the opioid epidemic. You'll get information on anatomy and pathophysiology in some of these guides. For this one, we delve a bit into pain definition and characteristics. The next section is the nursing considerations, which always starts at the top of the page. We typically start all of our sections at the top of a page so that you can find them easily within the guides, pull out whichever sections you wanna focus on in one education session. And again, we can provide a review for your staff for any of the sections in any of our available guides. For all of our clinical programs, you'll see a section for both nursing and therapy champions where we highlight what those roles could look like. These lead clinicians will be aware of any metrics that are getting tracked for the program, the evidence-based care or protocols involved, communication content and frequency, but these champions, like I said, they have they, they, these point people, I mean, they're involved in that communication content and frequency. And again, having that point, por point person, which we support wholeheartedly, can support organization around facility-wide program development, but it can also be very effective in maintaining successful programming across time. So you'll see potential roles for those champions, both for nursing and therapy in all of our guides. Under the nursing section, we also review evidence-based nursing care. And again, this is program specific for each of these guides and it usually covers one to two pages based on the topic. All right, after that is therapy consideration section. And this information is aimed to nurses to increase awareness of what's available in therapy to help expedite referrals and expedite care. And then finally, uh, on the next page, there'll always be an interdisciplinary collaboration section that covers considerations between departments for optimal coordination of resident care. In this case, we review non-pharmacologic interventions and ideas for resident and caregiver education. And then onto the next page, essential communication between providers. 
And then the guides end with supplemental resources, including program specific suggestions on CMS critical element pathways. If you're not familiar with these pathways, they are accessible on the CMS website and can be valuable resources for facilities to find potential care opportunities within a clinical program. Even taken the extra step to narrow down that list of pathways that pertain to each topic to help with that process of program development. So you'll see a list here that we've started for you for pain management. And with that review of the overall template structure, I'll pass it over to Dr. Wolman. Thank you very much, Dr. Grunani. Okay, I'm very happy to discuss the Quick Reference Guide for Pain. I know that all of you deal with the challenges of pain with your residents on a daily basis. Looking at prevalence, we know that pain affects about 79% of individuals over 85 years of age, which comprise a lot of your population. One in five nursing home residents has persistent pain. There are disparities in pain. We know that minorities and cognitively impaired residents experience more undertreated pain. So we should consider those residents as high risk groups who will require an additional level of pain assessment. Overall, you can expect over 50% of your residents in long-term care to have some type of pain on a daily basis, ranging from positioning discomfort, <clears throat> degenerative spinal arthritis, post-op pain, and pain from cancer or end of life issues. Clearly, there are high costs to pain. The national cost of pain ranges from 560 to $635 billion. And if you look at the little chart here, the amount of money spent on chronic pain is higher than the combined cost of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. The impact on the facility um, has multiple components. There are, have been quality measures related to pain that are reported on the Medicare Nursing Home Quick Care website. CMS recently removed those direct quality measures for moderate to severe pain as a way to support the federal initiative to reduce opioid use. Uh, facilities obviously still need to monitor pain as part of their clinical goals. We will update the QRG shortly to remove those specific references to pain. Other quality measures that obviously affect your residents have to do with mobility, um, activities of daily living, uh, and the potential for falls, all of which reflect pain management. Pain is also a frequent reason for emergency department visits and hospital readmissions. And as you know, those readmissions are costly because of the penalties for your facility. And the resident in any one of those hospital admissions is exposed to multiple adverse events. We talked about the fact that we also include a person-centered care plan and options for that person-centered care. The resident and family are at the center of the team. Person-centered care for the resident with pain is gonna be based on the location of their pain, characteristics of that pain, the sources or causes of the pain, the treatment regimen, the prognosis, personal goals for that person, the resident and their family. And sometimes we need to find out about their individual expectations of pain relief. Interdisciplinary team members are obviously critical to the plan of care. Nursing and therapy, clinicians and champions can recognize and manage pain. Pharmacists are going to recommend appropriate drug therapy and review high-risk regimens. Social workers obviously support resident and family goals <clears throat> and assess support systems. The mental health providers are gonna look at anxiety or depression as they relate to pain. The chaplain and spiritual support is critical to the plan of care. Obviously, primary care providers and the marketing and admissions staff who let your partners know about the quality pain management program that you have. All interdisciplinary team members should understand the unique resident goals and be actively involved in managing those transitions of care with improved coordination and communication. So who should be referred to your pain management program? Obviously, any new short stay resident admitted to the facility with pain as an issue, even if pain is a secondary diagnosis. Your long stay residents with pain will include those with increased or new complaints of pain. 
postural changes, moving, moving inappropriately in the chair or being uncomfortable in their positions, avoiding activity or having a decline in activity tolerance, more frequent or longer needs for rest break, difficulty with transfers, or any new difficulty with ambulation. So there's lots of challenges related to pain. Um, older adults frequently underreport their pain, which can be challenging because they aren't necessarily giving us an accurate picture of their pain. They underreport their pain for lots of reasons, including the belief that pain is a part of normal aging or can't be alleviated, not wanting to be a burden, or thinking that pain means serious illness or death. They also may lack just adequate knowledge about what pain management strategies are available to them. So we need to obviously make sure we're educating them on a consistent basis. Clinicians who are providing care for older adults with pain may frequently not completely or comprehensively assess all of their systems because they have so many comorbidities and illnesses and problems that might reflect pain. It does take a long term to do that comprehensive assessment but the entire interdisciplinary team is involved in sharing those issues. Residents and clinicians may have misperceptions about opioid medications. And obviously polypharmacy can be an issue with older adults. We know that so many of your residents have more than 10 or 12 or even 15 medications on a daily basis. So adding a medication or an analgesic for pain management, even such as an opioid or any of the other analgesics can interfere with other drugs and cause additional side effects. So residents have multiple psychological, physical, and socioeconomic consequences. Some of those physical consequences include potential for falls, obviously. They have more sleep disturbances, perhaps anorexia and malnutrition. Uh, some of the emotional and psychological issues have to do with depression, anxiety, fear, frustration, anger, because they have to deal with these challenges of pain on a daily basis. Uh, they can have social isolation and diminished personal relationships. Finally, but importantly, if we do not manage their acute pain, that person can actually develop persistent or chronic pain over time because the pain pathways can actually change. We obviously know there is an opioid epidemic, there's an opioid crisis and evidence-based Guidelines are changing on a regular basis. We know there's a dramatic increase in the acceptance and use of prescription opioids for the treatment of chronic non-cancer pain despite serious risks and lack of evidence. We're still collecting evidence about the use of opioids and their effectiveness. Just to give you a couple of examples, in 2016, almost 20% of older adults filled a prescription for opioids in the United States. And between 2010 and 2015, uh, there was a emergency department visits and hospitalizations related to opioid use actually doubled. So those are pretty powerful issues that we're dealing with. Inappropriate opioid use in residents can cause cognitive impairment, falls, and even cardiovascular events or death. But at the same time, we have already talked about the outcomes related to poorly managed pain. So we're constantly walking that tightrope and being very considerate about how we're using pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic interventions. In March of 2016, the CDC published some recommendations for prescribing opioids. They suggested that we set realistic goals for pain and function based on their diagnosis and make sure that non-opioid therapies, including non-steroidal and physical therapies, such as exercise, biophysical agents, ADL and functional mobility tra training are tried and optimized. Dr. Granani will focus on definitely multiple physical therapies that are appropriate for pain management. So what's the common definition of pain? It's an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage. The other pain definition that we need to consistently be aware of is down here at the bottom of this page. Pain is whatever the experiencing person says it is, existing whenever and wherever the person says it does. That definition came from Margot McCaffrey, who is a nurse, um, and that definition is about 50 years old, but we both really still need to think about it as a priority because our pain management programs can be influenced by our personal biases. Pain is also described based on the duration and the mechanism of the pain. Duration of the pain is obviously acute or chronic. 
Acute pain is of sudden onset, expected to last a short period of time. We usually define chronic or persistent pain as pain that is lasting three or more months. The mechanism of pain is described as being nociceptive or neuropathic. Nociceptive is further described as either visceral pain or somatic pain. The visceral pain is pain in the body's internal organs um, that can then activate pain receptors. So tissue injury activates those pain receptors. It can be poorly localized. It's usually constant pain. It can be described as deep and aching. It often refers to other sites. Uh, for someone with something like an MI, it can actually be described as more acute or crushing. The somatic pain is pain of the skin, muscles, joints, connective tissue, and bones. It's again relatively well localized, typically worse, obviously, with movement. Superficial somatic pain can be sharp, pricking, throbbing, or deep somatic pain can be dull, aching, and cramping, such as the pain you get from arthritis. The other, other examples would be low back pain, fracture would be an acute pain, obviously, the chronic pain from arthritis, uh, possibly pressure ulcer pain, and obviously neoplastic or cancer infiltration. Neuropathic pain is obviously nerve pain. Uh, it's an abnormal function of the central or peripheral nervous system. It's usually described as burning or possibly deeply aching as in the case of a neuropathy. It can be accompanied by sudden sharp pain and it often radiates down a nerve path, for instance, with, with a herpes zoster. Residents might complain of numbness and tingling, such as with a diabetic neuropathy, shooting pains or skin sensitivity over an area of skin. Um, other examples would be that neuropathy from a spinal stenosis or pain from a phantom limb pain. So we'll look at the nursing champion and nursing clinicians for a minute. The nursing champion is clearly somebody who is, is an experienced clinician and is interested in the quality of care for your residents, especially as it relates to pain. They can identify residents with pain and track clinical measures. Some of those measures might include uh, how many residents do you have in pain? How many hospital admissions or ER visits have there been because of that pain? Uh, what kind of pharmacologic and non-pharmacological interventions are you using for those residents? Um, maybe how many re the number of referrals that you make to the therapy department for pain management. Functional measures are just resident and family satisfaction with pain management. They want to promote the collection of clinical data and obviously throughout the course of the day. Encourage quality pain assessment using standardized tools. Uh, looking at the effects of medication and the non-drug interventions. Improving communication with the rehab team and other clinicians, especially within the team meeting and during clinical rounds. Almost all residents have some type of pain or are at risk for pain, so it's essential to identify those highest risk residents um, during clinical rounds so that we can communicate the comprehensive assessment data and plan of care to as many members of the team as possible. Validate the nursing staff is competent with pain assessment, all of the interventions that we use to manage pain, documentation, and evaluation. The champion is going to support resident and family education about pain symptoms and management. They're going to monitor transition and coordination of care issues, and certainly evaluate the resources and impact of your pain management program on your staff, collaborating with the therapy champion and the clinical program consultant on a regular basis what's working, what's not working. That clinical program consultant can help you with issues to improve your pain management program. The nursing care, nursing clinicians are going to identify some kind of method to identify residents with pain and make sure you communicate that with all facility care providers. They can, maybe they will keep a log at the nurse's station or definitely identify all of the issues related to pain during those clinical pain rounds. Looking at clinical data at the time of admission and during ongoing assessment, being very aware of the diagnoses, conditions, or sources contributing to pain. Regular evaluation and management of the pain, follow through with any suggestions about mobility from therapy, uh, definitely involved in resident and family education, discharge planning, and coordination of care. 
nursing staff is definitely going to assess pain. We can ask about the presence of pain. Do you have pain? Are you uncomfortable? Does it ache or hurt? People use different language sometimes related to pain. Rate the pain using a standardized scale. Um, the scales that you are generally using on your MDS have to do with the numeric pain rating scale. Or there's a verbal descriptor scale asking the resident, do you have mild, moderate, severe, very severe pain, or they're just unable to answer. The other pain scale that's commonly used is the FACES pain scale, which you can see here. It can be helpful for a lot of your residents. We can't use any of these scales, however, with those who have difficulty reporting their pain, such as your residents with dementia or having intellectual or impaired cognition or end of life residents. Um, we've given an example here for you of an alternative scale for those individuals who can't report their pain. Uh, it's called the pain AD or pain Alzheimer's disease scale, but it can be used for any of those populations that have difficulty reporting pain. So it's looking at um, nonverbal uh, effects of pain, breathing, negative vocalization, facial expression, body language, or whether they are consolable. Uh, so using that, I uh, recommend highly this a scale such as this in order to get more effective and accurate uh, information from your residents about pain. Nursing assessment is also going to include effectiveness of all of your interventions, the pharmacologic as well as all non pharmacologic interventions. Identify the emotional, social, and functional impact of pain, as well as attitudes and beliefs about pain. Uh, looking at their typical coping scale or their previous experience with pain or their cultural beliefs about pain. Environmental assessment is going to include positioning. How does that positioning support or perhaps negate your pain interventions? And what kind of equipment are you using to transfer or uh, move the patient more effectively and with less pain? Physical examination is going to include that general inspection, looking at those um, measures that we just talked about that are observable signs of pain. Uh, other physical examination is going to look at how are they ambulating, changes in ambulation, look at musculoskeletal deformities, range of motion. Are there new signs of trauma? Uh, is there redness or warmth of the skin? Are there broken teeth or other issues that can cause pain from the oral cavity? Um, abdominal pain or neurologic pain that can be assessed with motor or sensory, sensory assessment. So we'll look at analgesics here for a minute. It's really important. There's so many different types of analgesics that we use for residents. We need to have a general awareness of the onset, duration of action, typical dosages, and side effects for our residents. Additional geriatric experts state two priorities as it relates to the use of opioids. So we're gonna provide access to opioids when indicated to relieve suffering and improve or maintain function. Clearly, we do not want our older, impaired, frail residents to be in pain. Their second priority then is to promote the tapering of those drugs discontinuation and avoidance of the drugs when that goal to relieve suffering, improve or maintain function is no longer achievable. Some of the non-opioid analgesics that we do have available to us, acetaminophen or Tylenol, is almost always the first line therapy for mild to moderate pain because it doesn't have the same side effects as those non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs may have. Tylenol does not affect renal function, and it doesn't affect the GI system or cause GI bleeding. The only caveat with using Tylenol would be for your residents with liver disease because it is metabolized in the liver. So acetaminophen is helpful. It can be used around the clock for your residents, perhaps with dementia, with increased behaviors. Um, personally, I think that pain has a, a huge significance in behaviors for your residents with dementing illnesses. The non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, uh, <clears throat> again, would be aspirin that we obviously don't use very often for pain. Um, it could be the ibuprofen, Advil, there's also ibuprofen, Motrin, uh, naproxen, or Aleve. They are effective as anti-inflammatory agents. 
but again used with caution, secondary to the renal, cardiac, and GI side effects, certainly used the lowest dose for the shortest period of time. Adjuvants are drugs used for indications other than pain. They can be useful for analgesia. For example, a tricyclic antidepressant such as amitriptyline or an anticonvulsant such as gabapentin can be very helpful for the, uh, the neurologic or neuropathic type of pain that we see. Other topical local anesthetics can be very helpful. They have less systemic side effects such as lidocaine or a topical non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug that do come in topical preparation. Capsaicin is uh, comes from chili powder, but it actually interferes with that pain uh, effect within the tissues. The opioid analgesics that we see used most commonly are the mild to moderate agonists such as codeine, hydrocodone, oxycodone, or tramadol, which is a synthetic uh, opioid medication or a partial agonist. Hydrocodone and oxycodone are typically used in combination with Tylenol. So you'll see combination drugs such as Lortab or Lycodin or Percocet. Other more the stronger opioids that we use are morphine, hydromorphone, fentanyl, or methadone. And obviously prescribed by providers who are very um, experienced in managing opioid analgesic. So back to Dr. Granani. Okay, so um, this page starts off with the role of the therapy champion. It's very similar to what Dr. Woolman mentioned for the nurse champion in that this primary clinician within the therapy department is leading the program. They're helping with resident identification and tracking, making sure staff is aware and following evidence-based protocols, helping with care coordination, and really working closely with the nurse champion and the ACP consultant to assess the program and adjust the approach as needed. If we look at evidence-based treatment on this page, kind of towards the middle, the CDC released guidelines that recommend non-drug approaches such as therapy over long-term use or high dosage use of prescription painkillers. So therapy can be strategically incorporated as a safe and effective alternative or adjunct to opioid therapy for long-term pain management. I can't emphasize enough though that therapy can and should be involved for those residents with both acute or chronic pain. The nociceptive somatic pain that Dr. Woolman mentioned, that pain in the skin, muscles, joints, connective tissues, where you'll see residents complain of low back pain, pain from fractures or wounds, arthritis, post-operative surgeries, and then even neuropathic pain or nerve pain where residents might complain of pain from diabetic neuropathy, shingles, that spinal stenosis that was mentioned or residual or phantom limb pain after amputation. All of these e examples of pain can potentially be addressed in therapy. So be sure to make that referral as soon as you can. So therapy can begin the process of screening and evaluating for more conservative pain management options. When we think about what that evidence-based treatment can include, actually the majority of therapy interventions can address pain in some manner, whether that's with rehab technologies, manual therapies, or some type of exercise. For example, biophysical agents can directly address pain. Electrical stimulation helps release the body's natural opioids and helps nerves and muscles work together to get back normal movement. Other types of rehab technology, will, which we'll go into in just a sec, that involves energy into the body. That therapists can also include our ultrasound, which uses sound waves, and pulsed shortwave diathermy, which uses safe electromagnetic waves. And they can both help with warming tissues up, increasing blood flow to the area, or even decreasing swelling and inflammation. Mm -hmm. Residents may become fearful of pain with movement and then up end up in avoiding activities. So they can learn techniques or positioning to reduce strain on body structures in therapy. And we can also help identify and modify environmental factors contributing to their pain. Persistent pain may lead to abnormal movement patterns and problems with posture. So postural reeducation may be another component. Working on any tightness or stiffness and increasing the range of motion, providing aerobic and strengthening exercises, even teaching coping strategies to avoid flare-ups like
taking breaks, asking for help, modifying an activity. All of these strategies are used by therapists and can lead to overall enhanced safety, improved mobility, and of course, pain management. We wanted to highlight TENS, electrical stimulation for pain management. So it can be used as a complementary treatment with opioids if needed. So making everyone aware of it may help nursing and therapy work more closely together to find that ideal balance between pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic treatment. So definition of TENS, it's electrical stimulation of the skin to relieve pain by interfering with the transmission of pain signals essentially. We said earlier that using this type of electrical stimulation can activate the body's natural opioids. And these natural opioids target the same areas in the body that opioid medications do. However, the natural opioids do their work, attach to receptor sites and help relieve pain all without the risk of side effects, which you of course can have with medications. With some teamwork between, between departments, properly administered pain medication used with properly dosed electrical stimulation can provide optimal pain management for people. So it's really important to share with therapy if the, that resident is on opioid medications, when they get that medication, because they might be able to create a complementary therapy schedule and treatment plan that can provide additional pain management throughout the day or they can even work with nursing to help reduce opioid consumption while still managing the resident's pain effectively. So for example, if the resident is complaining of pain and it's not quite time to receive their next dose of medication yet, use what's available, collaborate with therapy, check if they can treat the resident at that time so the person can make it to their next dose with some conservative pain management instead. And then at the bottom of the page, we've listed ACP rehab technology that can support a successful pain management program. It's always good to be aware of this technology and confirm what's available in your therapy departments. I've seen um, departments sometimes organize events where therapists will have multiple residents they're treating throughout the day for pain management. And they'll go grab a nurse for just a couple minutes at the end of the treatment so the nurse can see the electrical stimulation being used on the resident, hear how it changed their pain through pre and post pain scales. And that experience can be so beneficial moving forward because that nurse may now be more likely to think about therapy, refer to therapy more quickly when they recognize an appropriate resident. So the Omniversa system in the top left picture with electrical stimulation and ultrasound and the Omni SWD in the picture right below it that uses a, a safe electromagnetic waves. These rehab technologies can generally be used to improve strength and range of motion and reduce pain and muscle spasms. Next is the OmniStand on the top right. This is a dynamic balance system which uses adjustable sway to challenge residents while keeping them safely supported during the standing balance exercises. It can adjust to the resident's height and width, and it also has a pelvic support strap and knee support bar that all help to maintain the person in standing. The Omni VR virtual reality system on the bottom right helps residents work out harder and longer, which can be particularly beneficial for residents in pain who have poor participation or motivation to move or exercise because of that pain. Being in that virtual reality environment helps distract them from their pain and then they're able to do more in a therapy session. And then the OmniCycle is the last piece of technology on the bottom right, which is a rehab system that uses a smart motor to help residents exercise. And it can also be used as a regular bike with different resistance levels too. For residents with pain management, this type of equipment can help increase limb movement, blood flow, range of motion, and strength. And that's it for therapy considerations. Uh, pass it back to Dr. Wollman. So on the last page, we're going to look at some of the interdisciplinary collaboration that is critical to any uh, program that you have. Program goals specifically for pain are to facilitate optimal care for the resident with pain across the continuum with improved care coordination and transition of care. Develop an interdisciplinary pain program within the facility, obviously emphasizing enhanced teamwork increase resident, family, provider, and staff satisfaction with pain management. 
the clinical goals that you will achieve are to improve function, improve quality of life, and obviously reduce pain symptoms, definitely reduce hospitalizations and mortality. And part of those clinical goals will be achieved by having quality program tracking and reporting. So we've, we've talked a bit already about pharmacologic uh, interventions, just as critical, if not more critical, to clearly think about the non-pharmacologic interventions. Dr. Granani just discussed some really high quality evidence-based interventions. Other interventions that can be used by additional members of the team um, who might be therapy depart, obviously therapy, art and music therapy, massage therapy, mental health providers, the chaplain. Psychological interventions would be distraction, relaxation, and mindfulness-based meditation, guided imagery, again, music or art therapy, controlled breathing, cognitive behavioral therapy. Other non-pharmacologic interventions that are incredibly effective are repositioning, avoiding postures and positions that provoke pain, energy conservation, getting restful sleep, the spiritual practices. And for, again, some residents, those will be more helpful than anything else that you might choose to implement. Massage therapy um, and the skilled therapy services that we have talked about. Resident and family education is critical to any program that you implement for pain management. Obviously that education should begin at the time of admission and continue through the time of discharge. What does the resident and family need to know about pain? A little bit about the pathophysiology. What causes the pain? How tissue and pain receptors relate to pain, just in a very simple way. And the impact of that pain on their function and their mental health, and why you're trying so hard to develop a pain management program that's effective for them. What are the interventions that you're using, their effects and possible side effects? If taking opioids, they should have some general knowledge of dependence, tolerance, and addiction. Again, just to remind ourselves, pain is multifactorial and it requires an approach that includes both pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic strategies. And we just to kind of summarize, communication is going to be the most critical part of any program that you have. Lots of interdisciplinary team members involved in pain management. So everybody needs to know what everybody else is doing. The role of the interdisciplinary team is to educate and support each other. For example, the pharmacist, nurse, therapist, and PCP can all share knowledge of pain management strategies. For example, a new drug option or knowledge about an individualized therapy that PT is using for that challenging resident with chronic back pain. So making sure everybody has the same information. Some of those elements of communication include documenting the assessment and reassessment of pain in a defined space so everybody has access to that information. Document the frequency of pain assessment, which might be different for each of your residents. Looking at the effects and side effects of all the treatment. Using those targeted pain assessment tools, especially for residents with cognitive impairment or behaviors by those who cannot report on their pain. Share the pain assessment tool or rating scale with therapy and other departments. They might not be aware of how pain AD is so critically effective for those residents who can't report their own pain. Discuss strategies used by each discipline in pain management in those daily or weekly pain huddles. Share the unique goals of care for that individual. What are their preferences for advanced care planning, advanced directives? And make, make sure you refer those individuals who are appropriate for hospice and palliative care at the right time. Use make communication tools such as SEAR, which means a situation, background, assessment, and recommendations, or stop and watch, which is an early warning tool to let people know about acute changes. Those tools are both actually recommendations from the Interact Quality of Care program. So if you don't have access to that, it might be something you want to look into. Those communication tools identify risk factors or clinical conditions that need to be actively managed with a focus on acute changes and preventing poor outcomes. Resident and family education and response to that information is part of our communication with other members of the team. The resident and family satisfaction with the pain management program. Obviously the coordinated discharge plan is part of the interdisciplinary team's role. 
ongoing education with all members of the team about the pain management program, the definition and characteristics of pain, what's involved in that comprehensive assessment, all of the pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic interventions and resources available from each department. Dr. Bhani mentioned some of the supplemental resources that are available for you here. Please take advantage of them. And thank you so much for attending the webinar. Pain management will continue to be challenging for all of us, but with a really good pain management program and your pain management team, you can definitely make a difference. Again, thanks for being here. Thank you so much for a fantastic presentation and have a lovely rest of the day. Thank you for those that were able to join us today. Very much appreciate it.